it's also useful to note that uh, uh, the literature uh, discusses also externally differentiated integration, which is when um, uh, rules apply uh, at least to one non-member state. Um, now, of course, there's a uh, differentiated integration is not the only possible way to accommodate diversity in the European Union. And another uh, possible approach is experimentalist governance. Um, here we see uh, national actors given, being given the discretion to, to pursue a variety of solutions. Uh, however, the process does not stop there. Uh, because we also see that uh, there are regular uh, reviews of uh, the implementation experiences with these different solutions, which may in turn prompt um, revisions. And so in that sense, experimentalism is, is, uh, can be conceived as a machine for learning from diversity, because it not only allows diversity, but also seeks to, uh, seeks to actively leverage it. Um, in contrast to differentiated integration, uh, uh, experimentalist governance does not really care about uh, distinctions between formal binding or, or uh, informal non-binding. This is not really distincting, distinctive. Uh, mm, but as the literature on differentiated integration, so the literature on, on experimentalist governance has also recently started looking at the external dimension. Um, however, it does so by looking at processes for creating, uh, monitoring and uh, possibly revising rules not, uh, not uh, uh, at the substantive rules as is done by external differentiated integration. So in this case, we talk when, when non-member state actors participate into the processes for creating rules and revising them, we can, call, we can talk about extended governance. And if uh, we see experimentalist processes, then we can talk about extended uh, experimentalist governance. Uh, now, uh, just a few words on the case selection. So why, why did I focus on, on, on electricity? The uh, first reason is that this is a strategic sector, uh, meaning that it has cross-sectoral effects, uh, just like uh, finance or telecommunication, for example. But the second set of reasons has to do with the fact that um, this sector has uh, characteristics which make it a plausible candidate for each of the three perspectives uh, I engage uh, with. So it, is, uh, it, it shows uh, strong interdependence, even stronger than, uh, than it is normally the case in internal market policy due to its technical characteristics. And so this, uh, from, from this point of view, uh, one would expect uniform rules across member states. Um, at the same time, it also uh, features um, uh, fairly strong levels of politicization. Uh, think about uh, the fact that member states retain sovereignty over fuel mixes. Uh, think about the uh, interventionist um, um, uh, actions of, of national governments, especially in the last decade, um, in the past decade, sorry, uh, to protect national champions. Or think about the more, more recent debate about uh, nuclear and renewables. Um, and so the literature tells us that uh, if uh, we have a combination of interdependencies and politicization, then we would expect uh, differentiated integration. And finally, uh, uh, electricity is also technically complex and also characterized by rapidly changing uh, technologies, which are said to favor experimentalist governance. Uh, now, within EU electricity regulation, I focus on uh, six examples, which were selected uh, uh, because, of, uh, because they are, considered, are commonly considered important. And uh, I use the process tracing and comparative method based on publicly available evidence plus a number of interviews. Now, this, this table, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but I'll guide you. Uh, through the core findings in the next slides. Uh, but this is just to give you a picture, an idea of what I looked at. So you can see in the first column that I, I focus on cross-border tarification and network access, which are considered key to market liberalization and integration. However, I also focus on, if you like, less market and more um, uh, security or operational <coughs> areas, namely regional security coordination. I looked at insider trading and market manipulation, which is really at the crossroads between energy and financial regulation. I looked at the whole uh, new class of uh, rules that have been produced since 2009, which are called network codes. 
and I also looked at renewable energy. And then in terms of how I proceeded in the analysis, I, 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 I looked first at the, the nature of the substantive rules, so how much uniformity they, they exhibited or how much discretion they left, and whether there was uh, internal differentiated integration. Then I looked at the processes for making these rules and revising them. And finally, I looked at the external dimension, so uh, at, at the dimension beyond the union's borders. Now, the key findings, uh, I have <coughs> four slides on this and are my final slides. Um, the first important finding is that uh, EU electricity regulation uh, appears to be characterized by a general ambition to uniformity, which is in line not only with the with the common uh, goal of, uh, of promoting a level playing field in internal market, but also due to the especially strong interdependencies of, of this sector. Uh, of course, there are exceptions um, uh, and, and sometimes there are compromises, but in most of the cases I looked at, EU rules exhibit uh, remarkably and growing uniformity. Uh, however, at the same time, and this is something that I had not anticipated and, and uh, that I think is quite interesting, uh, no matter how uniform EU rules might be, they always leave space for, for diversity. In some cases, this is uh, done explicitly. So we have uh, EU rules um, uh, saying explicitly you can do A, B, C. Um, uh, but in other cases, uh, this is not codified. However, uh, one finds room for diversity by looking at the level of granularity below the harmonized one. Um, and I think this is, this is, this is quite interesting. Uh, a second important finding is that contrary to theoretical expectations, uh, differentiated integration, as long as we are talking about internal differentiated integration, didn't really play any, any role, uh, despite high interdependence and relative politicization of, of electricity. Uh, by contrast, experimentalist governance processes play the role in most of the cases I, I looked at. So here we had actors um, setting up uh, provisions to monitor and to, and to, to monitor implementation experiences, uh, uh, review them uh, and, and uh, possibly revise rules on that basis. Uh, this is not always the case. Renewables appear to be the, the exception. Um, but, but this has been the case in most of the examples I, I looked at. Uh, a third important finding um, is that um, the uh, active use of diversity uh, in experimentalist processes, uh, in fact, led to the generation of more uniform rules over time. And this is something that was not uh, uh, problematized and theorized fully in the existing literature. Uh, at the same time, the same examples also show that uh, um, time and again, actors uh, uh, set up uh, provisions uh, for uh, rapidly revising the rules uh, based on the review of implementation experiences. So this suggests that the rules are becoming more uniform on the one hand, but at the same time, they're also becoming more revisable. And, and this links to, I'm, I'm sure that Jonathan will, will talk about it in the next uh, presentation, this uh, links nicely with emerging uh, findings uh, from in, in EU financial regulation, uh, where we see a combination of synchronic uniformity and diachronic uh, revisability. My final uh, slide and, and finding uh, is that uh, uh, in, in contrast to internal differentiated integration, where, as I said, we didn't really find any evidence of it. Uh, external differentiated integration played a role in all the examples I, I looked at. So in all the examples I looked at, uh, substantive EU rules applied also to countries beyond the union border. Not only, not only that, uh, in most cases, uh, in four out of six cases, actors from non-member states also participated to the creation uh, uh, and, and uh, revision of such rules, as described in extended experimentalist governance. Okay, I'm done. I hope it's a good uh, base for, for discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation and thanks for the excellent timekeeping, which with a 50 pages paper was not a trivial exercise. So <laughs> we just move right away to Jonathan, who I think can tie in very nicely to what we just heard. 
Jonathan. Thank you. Um, oops. So um, let me uh, let me apologize uh, from the outset for not supplying a fully written out paper. Uh, at the same time, um, this is very much work in progress. I mean, like everybody else, but uh, I wanted to give you some uh, some results uh, directly from the ongoing research. So I'm looking at the single supervisory mechanism uh, in banking union. Uh, it's a part of work package eight, whose core question is how far and under what conditions uh, may experimentalist governance be an effective and legitimate means of responding to diversity among EU member states compared both to com uh, conventional uniform regulation and DI. Now, the single supervisory mechanism is itself clearly a form of DI. It's nested within the single market and EU-wide financial regulation, but it faces itself uh, significant challenges of diversity across the member states within it. And uh, the research I'm doing focuses on organizational practices, what I call uh, the SSM in action, as well as the institutional structures. I'm using a process tracing approach, combining documentary analysis and elite interviews, both in the ECB and national competent uh, authorities. Um, let me start by counterposing two views of the uh, SSM. One is a centralized supranational hierarchy and the other as a polyarchic network. So uh, banking union itself is widely, and I think rightly considered to be the most significant step towards further uh, European integration since the Euro. Uh, the SSM is also widely considered to mark a decisive step towards supranationalization of EU financial regulation. It's clearly more centralized and hierarchical than the European supervisory authorities like the European Banking Authority. And it's often put forward as a possible model uh, for other sectors uh, within and beyond finance. Now, here are just a few features that make it look like a centralized hierarchy. Uh, it's the single supervisor for Eurozone banks. It has the final authority to grant and withdraw banking licenses. It directly supervises the 125 or so largest and most significant banks in the Eurozone. And it can take over uh, supervision of uh, so-called less significant institutions from national authorities where it deems it necessary. Uh, the SSM has created a harmonized supervisory uh, manual of methodologies and procedures. It's very detailed and prescriptive. It runs to well over a thousand pages. And it's built up joint supervisory teams of ECB and national uh, supervisors to conduct what it calls intrusive hands-on oversight of uh, significant institutions. And that's supported by on-site inspection missions. And uh, this is coupled with central benchmarking and review by the ECB's horizontal uh, services. Now, let me then present a, a counter view. So the SSM is a polyarchic network. Uh, all major decisions must be approved by the supervisory board where the national authorities have a decisive majority. The ECB doesn't directly employ or control the staff of the national authorities involved in offsite and onsite banking supervision. Um, the NCAs themselves retain an independent voice on EU financial rulemaking through the European Banking Authority, where there's a double majority voting arrangement to safeguard the interests of non-banking union member states. And this institutional setup arguably encourages what's been called a cooperative or managerial rather than a hierarchical enforcement approach by the ECB to joint supervision with the national authorities. So, okay, polyarchic network, uh, but how far can this be considered a case of experimentalist governance? Now, uh, Bernardo happily has already uh, given you a picture of experimentalism. We can define it as a recursive process of provisional goal setting and revision 
based on learning from comparative review of implementation experience in different local contexts. Uh, it's not universal nor ubiquitous in European regulation, but it is uh, arguably widely diffused across policy domains. It's important to note that if we look over the past uh, decade or so, uh, the typical pattern has been progressive formalization and reinforcement of EU regulatory networks without full supranational centralization. Uh, in some cases, uh, under conditions of high interdependence, uh, concern for the integrity of integrated markets has led to the creation of a single set of harmonized but provisional rules, which are revisable through ongoing review of implementation experience. And that's what Bernardo describes uh, in the case of electricity regulation. Now, so let's uh, now confront uh, experimentalist governance uh, with the SSM. Uh, now, it's obvious that the SSM diverges from the classic four-step experimentalist architecture in a number of important uh, respects. So uh, especially, uh, rather than setting open-ended framework goals and living, giving lower level actors substantial autonomy to pursue them in ways adapted to their own local circumstances, the SSM has developed increasingly detailed prescriptive rules and methods which banking supervisors are expected to apply as consistently as possible across jurisdictions. And what, what's the point of this? First of all, it's to promote integration of banking markets in the Eurozone. Secondly, uh, to reduce opportunities for regulatory arbitrage. And thirdly, to ensure fair treatment of Eurozone banks. Now, try to... But within these limits, there are clear signs of experimental <coughs> practices flourishing beneath what I call the SSM's hierarchical uh, veneer. So as a matter of policy, it doesn't seek to impose a so-called one-size-fits-all approach to supervision, or, nor to homogenize banks' uh, business models. Instead, it aims to accommodate banking diversity by tailoring common rules and methods to the specificities of individual firms and by combining national supervisors' deep horizontal, uh, sorry, deep knowledge of their local conditions with the ECB's broad horizontal experience. And the core idea here is to treat similar institutions similarly and different institutions differently across the banking union uh, irrespective of national uh, origin. So here we also see the idea of proportionality. So then let me just very quickly uh, mention some uh, more granular features of experimentalist practices within the um, SSM. And this is what uh, I've really been finding uh, in my, my interviews. So I want to mention uh, you know, four points. Um, the development of the joint supervisory teams has been a very intensive process of cross-fertilization and mutual learning among supervisors from different national systems. And the idea here is really to integrate a bo bottom-up information about uh, firm-specific risk profiles into the annual review and evaluation process. The SSM manual I spoke about earlier has been co-developed by the ECB and the national authorities. Everyone regards it as a living document, which is subject to continuous review and improvement, and improvement based on input from frontline supervisors. And there are a lot of mechanisms for that. Uh, we see at all kinds of levels, uh, ongoing peer review and joint policy development within and between the joint supervisory teams, the on-site supervisors, and the ECB divisional networks. And I have some slides in the longer uh, version that was pre-circulated on how this works uh, within one division for on-site inspection. And secondly, experimentalist practices of comparative review and continuous improvement are further developed through very, a very innovative second line supervisory quality assurance. And here again, I provide more details in the paper I can't go into now, but it's, uh, it's an extremely uh, innovative 
institutional form. And all of this aims at combining a high level of consistency and harmonization of practice at any given time with systematic comparisons of experience uh, in different local contexts and regular revision of methods and policies in light of that experience. And now I'm going to conclude. So I have four points I'd like to make by way of conclusion. First, uh, I think the case of the SSM shows that uh, experimentalist practices may and do flourish even within apparently hierarchical and centralized formal arrangements, and they do so in response to functional challenges of combining central coordination with local knowledge in complex, uncertain, and rapidly evolving environments. The SSM case also shows that experimentalist governance can coexist with differentiated integration and can provide a framework for learning from diversity within as well as between separate groups of member states. So we shouldn't forget that there is, a, once you set up a DI arrangement, that doesn't eliminate diversity, which still needs to be accommodated. The case of the SSM further supports the view that under conditions of high interdependence or what we can call tight coupling between participating units, harmonized rules and supervisory practices can be effective and they can be uh, acceptable to member states, provided that they're applied in contextually sensitive ways and regularly revised on the basis of local implementation uh, experience. And I might go so far as to say this kind of uh, di diachronic uh, revisability of regulation through experimentalism may thus uh, even be a condition for uh, synchronic uniformity of such regulation within the EU. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I'll have a few comments on those two papers and then I would like to ask those who want to ask questions to, uh, to ask their questions. Uh, by, by posting them in the chat. So these are obviously two papers that have to do with experimentalist governments. They come from the same project, so a huge similarity is not very surprising. Bernardo's uh, paper has a, let me call this, it starts as a quasi-experimental design. His argument is to say that all causal factors that are uh, leading to different types of rules, uniform interdependence leads to uniform rules, strong politicization would lead to differentiated integration and high complexity would lead to experimentalist governance um, are present in electricity. So he studies that deeply and uh, he would like to find out what leads, what, what findings do we have. So and while in the first uh, panel in the morning, we have heard some broad uh, studies with many, many member states. This is a very deep zooming into, into one policy field where you learn a lot about uh, bodies that you probably have never heard of in your life. So I have a few nitty gritty remarks and also some broader points to, to both papers and actually also some comments on the entire panel here. One is the concept of politicization. I think it's really important to, to distinguish different pathways here. I think in your paper, you have on the one hand what one would call sovereignty concerns. The, some countries would like to be in control of their energy production. You could call they want energy sovereignty. This is a country-based preference in many respects. And I think the countries are behind this. But it's not politicization in the sense that this is broadly concerned, that you have uh, broadly debated, that you have controversial discussion and that they have high salience. It's just this country wants that. The other thing is the big energy debates, nuclear energy pro and con, uh, subsidizing renewables pro and con, that splits a country. And I think these two things might lead to very different types of uh, positions at the European level and to very different types of either differentiation or experimentalist government. That is my, my smaller uh, comment. On the paper, I mean, I said it, it starts as a kind of theory testing paper, but I think it, it doesn't attempt this. It doesn't want to attempt this. In reality, I think the argument is much more like Jonathan's paper. Uh, underneath uh, uh, a context of strong hierarchy, we have still experimentalist government. That is, so to speak, I think the puzzle of the paper. We have 
interdependence everywhere and in your 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 uh, table and i think in your paper you make it very clear that uniformity actually prevails you know so you could say well what's the problem here this is high interdependence this is internal market regulation there's not much differentiated uh, integration there's a bit of external di that is interesting but not so super surprising that's these few small countries who would just participate in the use electricity market um, but underneath this, we have a lot of experimentalist governments in the formulation and in the revision of those policies. You know? And uh, so we have experimentalist governments in, in, in the problem definition and in the monitoring and uh, evaluation. And to me, when I, when I read this, and this is a bit a critique of this idea of experimentalist governance, so it's also addressed to Jonathan. I mean, this is almost synonymous to the policy cycle. You know, we, uh, the, the idealized policy cycle, policymakers try to find out first, what is the problem here? They do not really know what the problem is under conditions of uncertainty, cognitive and normative uncertainty. They try to find out what they want to solve. Then they put a policy into place and it can be very uniform policy. Then they look at this policy and try to find out, well, how did it go, you know? So my question here is, is this really surprising? What is the benchmark? Is the benchmark of this study an ideal uh, of total uniformity? And then you find out that is surprising that we do not have total uniformity, you know? Or do we have something where we have actually quite tight rules? There's not much differentiation. The image that I get from this is, this is a quite rigidly uniform uh, set of rules, the European electricity market. That's quite remarkable, given all the sovereignty concern, all the debates about the European energy market, all the big financial issues at stake. And there's a little bit of leeway there. You know, that is my take from the paper. The second uh, paper, Jonathan, on the single supervisory mechanism. <clears throat> I mean, you, Jonathan makes a big, starts with a big contrast. You know, there's this generalist view that the SSM is a strong hierarchy. I remember, I think, an earlier presentation a year ago at 30, we had exactly this debate where people said, well, come on, experimentalist governments, the SSM, this is pure centralist, top-down governance. You have this 1,000 people sitting in the European Central Bank and supervising all the banks and nothing is being experimented here too. And you're saying, no, it's not that easy. Underneath this big layer of hierarchy, underneath this surface of hierarchy, there is a, is a polycentric, there is a networked SSM, um, <coughs> excuse me, and there we do have experimentalist governments, you know? And I think empirically that makes uh, a lot of sense. You have, uh, you have two, I think, broad statement. One is you can say experimentalist governance can coexist with differentiated integration. You know? Again, my question would be, Yes, but why not? I mean, is it really an alternative to DI? You know, when you put it into the context of the policy cycle that at specific pa phases of the policy, this uh, scheme of the, of the four phases of experimentalist government, at specific phases, experimentalism makes a lot of sense. And I would argue independently of uniform, differentiated or whatever type of governance. So it's good to see this. It's important. In, uh, it's empirically interesting to point this out, but is it surprising? I don't know. It must not be surprising, but it, it doesn't surprise me at least. And I would say the reason for this is that experimentalist governance solves a different problem than the eye solves. You know, it solves a problem of high cognitive uncertainty, a, a bit of variation in the normative orientation, but under conditions of huge cognitive uncertainty where there is probably no need for huge uniformity. The second thing is uh, it can exist even in a high, highly hierarchical setting. This is what you put to the front line very much uh, in, in your presentation. Yes, that is true. But taking up that uh, debate a year ago, I would say, but one shouldn't forget probably with relatively small limits, you know, with a relatively narrow limit. This is uh, uh, evidence about practices of implementation about context sensitive implementation of a quite hierarchical centralized policy. You know? It makes a lot of sense. And again, I think it's important to highlight this, that even the SSM is not this top down, all the, all the differences are crushed by the centralist administration here, uh, 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 institutionalization, but it also has a degree of context sensitivity. You know? And that I think 
empirically is important. My, my general question that I have to, to both of you and probably to the entire panel and the entire group is, well, um, on the one hand, or it's, it's two or three points. On the one hand, we do not have in most of these papers an extra EU competition. So what sometimes is uh, appearing is that this whole differentiated integration, experimentalist governance, differentiated implementation debate creates the impression that these phenomena are particularly important in the EU. You know? That I think is convincing in DI. It's relatively rare. We have this in asymmetrical federalism, but it's relatively rare that in a polity, whatever, you have to show your passport in the middle of the territory. You know, this is Schengen, this is really DI, and that is, that is surprising somehow. But for differentiated implementation and also for experimentalist government, well, I think that all the argument would gain a lot in traction if we could say, well, this is strong, much stronger in the EU than elsewhere because of this. You know, that is my first point. And I think for the whole project, we should be careful when we look under the lamppost, you know, we see differentiation everywhere and heterogeneity everywhere, but it might also be everywhere. The second thing is, um, how shall I put it? What, what differentiation is, and it's really more a question to the entire group, not specifically to those papers, what differentiation is still important, you know? I mean, are we really arguing against this benchmark of a totally centralist, totally uniform policy that is implemented 100% without the slightest margin of appreci appreciation everywhere? You know, is this idea, does this exist everywhere? Or do we some, how uh, end up with the what I would call the differentiation of triviality, you know, the, the color of certain forms, the font size of certain forms. I mean, who cares, you know? Don't we have a phenomenon in, in each and every law, even in centralized states, where you have open formulation? In German, the, I cannot translate the term, it's unbestimmte Rechtsbegriffe, you know? These things like all appropriate means, the necessary uh, things, a safe uh, operation, what on earth is safe, we do not know this. So I think um, to some degree, these studies uh, border into something that we have also elsewhere. And I think it would be important to make clear where and why the EU is important. And my final comment is, well, the reason for this may be that all the three mechanisms, DI, differentiated implementation, experimentalist governance, really respond to different heterogeneities. Okay. It's, it's presented by me. Um... Yes, I will go to PowerPoint presentation and I will start here. So thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. I will present our draft paper with preliminary findings about linking differentiated integration and compliance, same, same, but different. Um, and I will start directly with the research questions we have asked ourselves. Does, the first one is, does differentiated integration reduces non-compliance? And the second one is, how does differences in compliance patterns impact demand for differentiated integration? So what we already can see from a research question, from a research questions is that it is assumed that both phenomena are interconnected and there is, they are connected in some kind of a cycle. So there's no one way direction of the causal process, but a direction back. So let's dive into the theory. Um, differentiated integration secondary law is not a common research topic as only a few paper has have only addressed this, so I will um, shortly explain what it actually means. Differentiated integration means that, um, of course, that a member state gives, um, has a specific opt-out, but in secondary law, it can actually take different forms. So there, are, and these forms depend on two dimensions, on scope and time. So, um, Differentiations can last only for, for, for a certain period or can only um, address certain articles in a directive. I will focus on directives in this presentation. And um, what, what we can see is like um, that partial temporary opt-outs and full temporary opt-outs and partial permanent opt-outs can impact compliance. But of course, full permanent opt-outs 
cannot impact compliance because they do not member states do not have to comply at any point in time so they have to be excluded from the analysis um, theorized sources of differentiated integration in secondary law are capacity concerns and inefficient bureaucracy limited staff numbers corrupt bureaucracy um, or for example wealth to actually staff the bureaucracy more efficiently are theorized sources of differentiated integration in secondary law. Uh, there are other sources like preferences and as already came up in the discussion, preferences cannot be really um, separated from identities and sovereignty concerns because um, preferences can be on an elite level, on a political elite level or on an economic elite level like the interests of interest groups and parties and governments but they can also be based on identities and this is like from the post-functionalism argument that it's the more the preferences of um, the public as already Catherine has said that um, the public has interests in uh, differentiated integration so it makes sense to actually um, take them into account yeah and these are resources and when we come to non-compliance which means that member states do not implement EU law in time or correctly international law um, the same sources are theorized. So capacity concerns, preferences, but there's also another explanation which is not mentioned in, differentiated in the differentiated integration literature uh, in secondary law, um, that there's a specific norms and cultures. So that laws, for example, on the um, rule of law impact compliance behavior of member states. So um, the um, paper by Gerda Faltner uh, and her co authors in uh, 2007 actually make this argument really um, important that the word of compliance actually impact compliance between member states. So bringing this together, because it was already argued in 2001 that differentiated integration and non-compliance and secondary law are two sides of the same coin, the theorized heterogeneity between member states is based on the same sources so that it is legit legitimized to assume that the one heterogeneity might um, offset the um, heterogeneity on the, on the other level, but there are important differences between um, uh, differentiated integration and non-compliance because um, the supply condition is really different because the venues differ. So differentiated integration has to be negotiated between member states and every state has to agree on that. Um, so it's really difficult to negotiate and non-compliance can be easily implemented as it can, as only one member state has to take the decision, the respective member state. And the potential cost structure differs. So um, the potential costs for uh, differentiated integration in secondary law are, for example, bargaining costs, loosening of consensus, being outvoted, and qualified majority voting, so there might be hard bargaining going on. Uh, and potential costs for non-compliance are penalty fees. And here comes the culture argument that um, other member states um, and the, the domestic culture of norms, for example, for the rule of law, um, might impact the costs for elites not, non -com not complying to EU law. So they might face electoral costs or for um, yeah and so um, here I want to I want to show how I assume everything is related and I know it's a quite complicated graph but I <laughs> but I hope it makes it a bit more clear what is happening because the time structure is also quite important because for the first hypothesis we have the lat lat latent variable that heterogeneity impacts differentiated integration and it uh, impacts positively the chances for differentiated integration. But differentiated integration is assumed to offset heterogeneity between member states. So there is um, the relationship back to it. And by this, by offsetting this relationship, uh, this heterogeneity, it is assumed that non-compliance becomes less likely. However, what we already see is that Acts which have a differentiation are assumed to be much have 
much higher levels of heterogeneity than X which are not differentiated. So we already have a pot uh, potential bias in this relationship. Um, and yes, and for the second hypothesis, cultures are assumed to impact the non-compliance behavior. So in countries with um, a strong rule of law, um, pub public officials are assumed to follow the rules. And so they actually bargain more for differentiated integration in secondary law as it, for, the, for them is the only option to, or a more likely option to, um, to, to protect the diversity of, uh, protect their interests or capacity. And so it is assumed that this is going to happen. Um, so this are the two hypo hypotheses, the I reduces non-compliance, but it can happen that convergence is already an, an offsetting of heterogeneity. This is the prob problem I mentioned because of the selection bias. And hypothesis two is that member states differ in their demand for the I based on their compliance pattern. Um, the Dude, I use the UDIF2 data and Berlin infringement data, and I only look at new legal acts which contain a differentiation. And for now, I only can, um, I only look if there is a correlation. I don't look at time patterns. For now, I want to include that, but um, I haven't done that. And so I'm doing cross tabulations and correlations, correlations for testing the hypothesis. Um, do you, due to the pr uh, problematic relationship. And for um, hypothesis one, I updated the table, so it's, it differs a, a slight, um, slightly from the uh, table I presented in the uh, paper. Um, we see that compliance rate of differentiated acts and non-differentiated acts do not differ that much. Here they differ by 5%, and actually the um, differentiated acts have a lower, uh, have a higher non-compliance rate which is quite interesting. And it's actually against our expectations. <laughs> and for hi, um, hypothesis two, I, um, we um, did a correlation of member states and we can see here member states patterns of um, all um, rates um, of um, differentiated acts, but it's standardized against all legal acts which are valid for a respective country. So we actually standardize for different entry points. To, uh, towards the European Union um, and rate of acts implemented without an infringement procedure. And what we see is a negative relationship. So actually countries with a high rate of differentiated acts have also high rates of um, uh, non-compliance. So it's more a comp uh, complementary than compensatory, uh, compensatory relationship. And we have outliers like uh, Germany, the UK and Denmark. And so we find um, the opposite effect of everything which is theoretically assumed, um, which is quite puzzling and we try to look more into that. And how we want to proceed further, we want to look at the time pattern, if this, if this varies over time. And we want to look at differences in policy fields. And also we want, we, we're thinking about making the heterogeneity between member states more visible and trying to code like um, negotiations in the EU Council. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I propose that we just move on to the next paper by Sebastian, Hubert and Robert. <clears throat> yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Markus. I will also share my, my screen. Um, and let me get this started. So, um, yes, our paper is uh, uh, on the scope for flexible implementation in EU, EU legislative acts. Uh, this is part of work package seven on flexible implementation. Um, and what we, what we study in that work package is the extent to which EU legislation, um, EU law offers room for member states to differentiate in the way they implement uh, EU legal norms. So we differentiated or flexible implementation is a way to, to allow for another type of differentiation than what we know from dif differentiated integration, because the legal norms as such apply to all member states, but member states have room to 
uh, implement them uh, differently to a greater or lesser extent. And this can be seen as a, as a response to differences between member states. Member states differ in, in terms of their legal, economic, uh, social systems, also the natural uh, conditions uh, prevalent in, in, in a member state. And, and differentiated uh, flexible implementation allows member states to, to tailor EU policies and EU law to those specific uh, conditions and also to take into account differences in, in preferences if they exist. Um, and in that sense, it may function as an alternative uh, or as a complement to, to forms of differentiated integration. Now, in the, in the work package, we, we do two things, basically. So phase one, which is still ongoing and, and hopefully will be finalized sometime at the end of this summer or, or, or just after, uh, tries to <coughs> map the scope for flexible implementation by creating a data set of EU directives, uh, which are coded uh, provision by provision to see what kind of uh, uh, discretion, if any, uh, they, they offer. And then in the second part of the, uh, the work package, which will start after summer, we are going to see to what extent member states actually make use of the scope for flexibility offered by EU legislation. So we'll study three case studies in different areas uh, and four member states uh, to see whether uh, member states actually use the, the discretion they have and what kind of implications that has for, for EU governance and the effectiveness of, of, of EU law. Now, just to, uh, so in this paper, we, this, this paper is part of, of, of part one. So here we, we map the scope for flexible implementation. Now, what we did in the, or what we are doing in a data set is that we, we basically code for two things, uh, some other stuff alongside, but these are the two main things. So first, we, we look for types of discretion. Uh, we uh, discern five types, uh, for instance, elaboration dis uh, discretion, which means that member states can specify a legal norm or minimum harmonization, which means that member states can go beyond an EU standard. Uh, so we try to find out which types occur in EU legislation. And we also code for constraints that go with it, because in many cases, discretion is not granted sort of as a carte blanche, but it is accompanied by, by constraints, for instance, approval from EU uh, actors, or at least uh, reporting requirements, uh, or substantive standards that need to be taken into account. So this is what we coded for. Uh, and where we are now is, is this. Um, we made a selection of directives. Actually, we, we included all uh, uh, directives uh, uh, between 2006 and 2015 that were also in the EU DIV 2 data set, the same data set that Ronya has used. Uh, EU DIV 2 is on differentiated integration in secondary law. Um, uh, so later on, we also hope to be able to, to link these two data sets. Um, coding was done by trained coders at Masaryk University in Brno. Uh, these were master level students who were first trained and then set to work to, to code all these uh, directives. And we currently uh, have coded 85 directives, which were adopted in the period 2006-2009. Eventually, there will be 152 directives for the whole uh, period. Um, uh, but that is work that still needs to be done. And this also means that what we have now is very professional. Uh, and, and what we can only do is sort of show what we have, ask questions about it, uh, and, and, and at least sort of see what, what the data so far uh, um, brings us. So I would then like to give the floor to Hubert to talk about the data themselves. Okay. All right. So in the, thank you. In the remaining five minutes, I'm going to show our first explorations to the universe of the EU directives, uh, particularly uh, to the room for discretions the EU directives leaves. So first, you see that the EU directives are quite diverse pieces. Uh, EU directives contain from zero room for discretion for member states to as much as two thirds of provisions of directives can include some provision. Uh, typical uh, directives include between 20 to 25 percent of provisions with some discretion being given to the member states. And interestingly, it seems uh, that there is no relationship between the length of a directive and the room for discretionary leaves. So you can have short directives which have zero discretion, 
but also show directives which leave loads of discretion. Uh, what kinds of discretion appear in the directive? Uh, in directives, well, uh, the most uh, of the directives, um, um, the most um, uh, frequent type of discretion is the so-called elaborate, dis elaborate discretion, which basically the e provision of the e directives sets the guidelines and leaves uh, the member states to elaborate on details. The other four types of discretion, which Sebastian talked about, so the minimal harmonization, uh, reference to national scope uh, discretion, they are represented uh, approximately by the same, uh, same ratio. Probably the most interesting part of uh, this preliminary, very preliminary exploration is looking at which policies leaves what extent of flexibility in the directives and we what we found out is that there is some variability especially the directives in the field of taxation and freedom of establishment contain more um, room for discretion than the directives in the fields of environment and consumer protection this came a little bit against our initial intuition, which was that probably the internal market directives like taxation and freedom of establishment will have less discretion than others. But no, these um, directives included a lot of room for member states to, uh, to adjust directives into their national peculiarities. Um, Discretion in the directives is frequently um, frequently connected with the constraints. The by far the most typical constraints is what we call a substantive constraints, which means that okay, states are given room for their flexibility, but they have to follow this and this direction. So they are they are constrained by specific rules given by the EU legislator. Uh, the second most used type of constraint is the notification. So the states are obliged to notify com typically commission uh, in what sense they have used the room for discretion. Uh, this primary exploration leaves us with some questions uh, we would like to elaborate more in the next phases of uh, the project. And the first one is pretty straightforward. Uh, why uh, the EU legislator chose directive as a type of, of legal act when you have some directives which leave no room for any discretion? The second and probably the core one is gonna be deeper elaboration or into the policy areas and the room for discretion left in the EU directives for member states. Um, because um, if you do some initial theorizing, you can come up with both answers. It's, you can both find explanation for why some policy areas are having a high uh, level for discretion, also low level of discretion. So we want to dig into it much deeper. Uh, finally, uh, we would like to see uh, some patterns in uh, what types of constraints typically follow what types of discretions. But this is uh, for the further stages of the project. First, we have to finish our coding and then, of course, do much more work on uh, the interesting question we started popping up. Thanks a lot to Marcus for his questions. So he already provided us with a lot of room for thought, and we are looking forward to your final suggestions. So thanks a lot for listening. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentations. I think we do not have so much time left, but quite a number of questions. So I'll be brief, really. The first paper by Baronia. And, and Stefan is on the one hand, one that explicitly says, well, we are at the beginning of research. The second actually is also a little bit at the beginning of research and not at the end. And it starts with this real puzzle. You know, we have this very strong and very plausible expectation 
uh, differentiated integration and compliance should somehow get together and what do we find well they don't you know this is really a problem you know and uh, that is an interesting thing uh, i have two two comments really on this one is on on terminology and i start this by just reading uh, to you something from your paper i know it's unfair to read other people's stuff but i do it nevertheless you know you say non-compliance is a non-institutionalized form based on an action by a single member state without transparently communicating or consulting other member states i mean i could also say theft is a non-transparent etc form but i think what is important really is and that is uh, I, I do not try to make jokes on your back you know my point is i think non-compliance is illegitimate that is very important Differentiated integration and experimentalist governments and discretionary implementation are legitimate forms. Non-compliance is illegitimate. I think that is really important to keep in mind. And having said that, and that is my second point, um, this is probably one of the one of the avenues that might be worth exploring a little bit more. I mean, what strikes me in all these non-compliance debates where we have a huge differentiation of causes, motives, and factors, etc. For me, there is still this fundamental distinction between I do not comply because I do not want to comply. You know, this is where enforcement really helps or because I'm unable to comply. So if I just do not know what to do, the policeman also doesn't help me. And I, uh, it, it may be that differentiated integration also reacts differently on these two patterns. I do not know whether it holds, but it may be worth, worth exploring. So my, my overall uh, recommendation is zoom a little bit more deeply into this i mean the the relationships do not ho seem to hold on a very aggregate level but there's something that is on a on a more on a more fine-grained level on sebastian hubert and and robert i mean my my first comment is to say well this is a great start why don't you go ahead and then pass on the question but that is not my role so what i like very much with this 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 paper also when i think about earlier uh, uh, starts, I think you have a very clear concept of flexible implementation. It's a legitimate form. This is the difference to non-compliance. And it has a very clear place in this accommodating uh, diversity and heterogeneity um, debate. You know, you have, I think, interesting findings empirically. Uh, just, it may be probably worth having a look at because you ask it in your paper well what what could could one further look at probably the types of discretion are worth exploring because there may be a reason for these types of discretion and one of the things that may cause them but this is really wild guess uh, is probably this is not so much interest based you know uh, but probably the the, the reason for these types of discretion is really also legal systems, legal backgrounds in the member states that are behind this, you know. And on your last puzzle on taxation, you were so surprised that internal market is highly differentiated. I mean, with taxation, I have a out of the blue a theory on this first, a lot of money is involved. You know, you change a comma in the tax regulation and it costs the state 5 billion euros. So they really care for this. And the second thing is you have very diverse and very complex tax systems. You know, so even if you want to harmonize this totally, the entire history of EU tax harmonization is one, is a, is a, a discovery that we cannot come to complete harmonization. That would mean euro taxes. If we regulate national systems of taxation, we have to be extremely fine grained because you, these are super complex and super resource intensive systems with super strong vested interests. And that may explain the differentiation.